Hello everybody and welcome to module 12-4. Here we're going to be looking at another goodness of fit test, this time a normal distribution. Now it's similar to a test that we've done before. This is still going to be an upper tail chi-squared test. So we're still going to be comparing an observed frequency with an expected frequency. That expected frequency is what we would expect the frequency to be in a world where the null hypothesis is true, so we still are going to be operating, as we have done in all of our tests, we're still going to be operating under this assumption that the null hypothesis is true until we have evidence to show otherwise. So if the null is true, here's what we would expect. Here's what we observe, these frequencies. If what we observe is very close, the difference is very small, well then that's going to give rise to a small test statistic. If those differences are large between what we observe and what we would expect if the null were true, then that gives rise to a large test statistic. As an upper tail chi-squared test, if those differences are large, that gives rise to a large chi-squared test statistic, which may or may not bring us into that rejection region. So, all of that's the same. Same as what we did in the multinomial, same as what we did in the test for independence and uh, across multiple population proportions. We've used the same methodology. The big difference that we're going to encounter here, and maybe you can already see this just looking at the data that's been given to us, how do I figure out our observed frequencies? How do I figure out our expected frequencies? Because here I just have a sample of data. Now we're working with a continuous distribution. So where this exercise is different from the others is that now in order to obtain both our observed frequencies and our expected frequencies, we need to set up and define intervals. Intervals within that normal distribution. And in fact, they're going to be called intervals of equal probability within that normal distribution so that I know if the null is true and if it is normally distributed, I'll set up these intervals so that there's a known frequency in each. Now, what is that known frequency going to be? Well, here we have to bring in a bit of a, a, a necessity, something that has actually been with us throughout all of module 12, but we haven't talked about it because it hasn't been an issue until now. But we have this rule that those expected frequencies for this chi-squared test to work, those expected frequencies need to be greater than or equal to 5. So what we're going to do, not yet, but what we're going to do when we get here is we're going to set up intervals so that the expected frequency, the expected number of observations in each interval is going to be 5. That meets this requirement for this chi-squared test to work, and that gives us our expected frequency that then allows us to obtain our observed frequencies. So let's get into this, and then we'll talk about it as we go. A simple random sample of 30 grades from a Principles of Microeconomics course are listed below. They've been sorted from largest to smallest, although it looks more so like smallest to largest, for convenience. And that is a convenience. If you have been given a, a data set and it has not been sorted, I absolutely recommend the first thing you do is sort it because that's going to make counting your observed frequencies somewhat easier. So it's a good idea to sort your sample first. Here I can see the mean grade is 61. This is a sample mean. So this is the sample mean of these observations. And this is a sample standard deviation of 17. So that's the standard deviation again of that data set. Now here it's been given to us. I have every expectation that those of you watching this know how to calculate a sample mean and you know how to calculate a sample standard deviation. First step, same as always, formulate the null and alternative hypotheses. These are a little bit long-winded. The null hypothesis is that the population is normally distributed with 
a mean of 61 and a standard, I'm just going to abbreviate, deviation of 17. It's a little bit long-winded, but this is what we are testing, right? Do we have evidence to show that these observations come from a normal distribution? One with a mean of 61 and with a standard deviation of 17. So that is what we are going to use when we say we're going to assume the null is true until we have evidence to show otherwise. That is what we're going to use to determine our intervals, to determine our expected frequencies. The alternative, well, it probably is what you would expect. The population is not normally distributed with a mean, I'm just going to abbreviate because I'm running out of space, and standard deviation 17. So, we operate under the assumption that the null is true. If the null is true, then that means it's normally distributed, which means that I can set up some intervals that contain a known number of observations. So I'm going to start with our standard normal distribution. And then I'm going to connect that to our hypothesized distribution, one that has a mean of 61 and a standard deviation of 17. Now we need to define intervals so that I can count my observed frequencies. We're going to hold this rule, and in fact we're going to hold it with an equality. So I'm going to use that rule that I want to have intervals so that my expected number of observations in each of those intervals is equal to 5. Okay, so I have 30 grades. I have a sample of 30. If I calculate 30 divided by 5, well, that gives me 6 intervals that would contain 5 observations each. So that gives me the size of my interval. Now I'm going to use that to determine their, their width within that distribution. So these equal probability distributions. Now, when I look at the standard normal distribution, the area under that curve is equal to 1. So if I break that into 6 intervals, 1 over 6, well, that gives me a probability of 0.1667. So if I come down here, I'm going to split this into 6 intervals. So here I'm going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 intervals. So each one of these intervals, we say they're of equal probability. So when I look at this one here, this is an area of 0.1667 is also an area of 1667 and you guessed it this area here 0.1667 and of course those add together to give me 0.5 because I know the lower half of that distribution is equal to 0.5 and it's symmetric so the upper half is equal to 0.5 as well so the first thing that I need to do is to find those z-scores that correspond with those equal probability intervals. How do I do that? I'm going to go down to my z-tables, and I'm going to look up what is that z-score that corresponds to a probability in the lower tail of 0 0.1667. So if I come down here, and I'm looking through this table for 
Well, the closest that I see here looks like right about there. So that is negative 0.97. So that gives me a value here of negative 0.97. Now, I need this next one. Now that's the Z score that corresponds to an area in that lower tail of 0.1667 times 2, which is around 0.3334. Okay, so I'm going to go to my tables and I'm going to find 0.3334 or the number closest to it, because there's going to be some rounding error in here as well. And 0.3334, looks like that's about it right there. So that's negative 4, negative 0.43. So this gives me here negative 0.43. Then my next value is 0. My next z score there is zero. That's our mean of our standard normal um, standard normal distribution. And then the next two, well, these are symmetric. This distribution is symmetric. So this one is going to be plus 4.43. And this one is going to be plus 0.97. So there I have my standard normal distribution divided into six intervals, six intervals of equal probability. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is transfer these down into my assumed population distribution. That population distribution that has a mean of 61 and a standard deviation of 17. So this first one here, well this is going to be 61 minus 0.97 times 17. Right? It's that sample mean minus that z score 0.97 times 17. So 61 minus 0.97 times 17. So that gives me a lower value of 44.51. Now, if the null hypothesis is true, I would expect to see five observations in that lower interval. Now for this next one, that Z score was negative 0.43. So same calculation, 61 minus 0.43 times 17, 61 minus 0.43 times 17, well this is 53.69. I would expect, if the null hypothesis is true, five observations between 44.51 and 53.69. Now the next interval is already given to us. I would expect five observations there as well, because 61, of course, this calculation, if we wanted to be um, very specific, is going to be 61 plus or minus a zero times 17, right? So that just gives us 61. This next one is going to be now 61 plus 0.43 times 17, 61 plus 0.43 times 17, this one is 68.31. Once more, I would expect five observations in that interval between 61 and roughly 68. The, the last point up here, so now that's plus 0.97, so 61 plus 0.97 times 17, 61 plus 0.97 times 17, that gives me 77.49. And I'd expect 5 here, and I would expect 5 here.
So there we have our intervals, and those intervals were obtained by specifying that we want to have those expected frequencies of 5 in each of those intervals. So having those expected frequencies preset at 5 in each, that determined that determined the number of intervals that we were going to have, and that determined the level of probability that we were going to use in obtaining those six intervals. Now that I have my six intervals, now I go back to my sample, and now I can obtain my observed frequencies. So in each of those intervals, how many observations do I actually see? And then I can compare that to what I would expect. So what I'm going to do here, we already have all of our expected frequencies. We have five, right? Or six of these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Every one of our intervals, as defined the way that we've obtained them, they each should have five observations in them if the null is true. Now we're going to go back to our sample. And I'm going to look at that lower limit, that lower level, that smallest interval, the lowest interval, call it what you will, 44.51. So how many observations do I have that are less than 44.51? Well, I only see one. So my observed frequency here is just going to be one. Now I'm looking between 44.5 and 53.7. So between 44.5 and 53.7, I have one, two, three, four, I have five. So my observed frequency there, I see five observations in that interval. Now we're looking up to 61. So how many of observations up to 61? One, two, I see just three observations there. So I'm going to come down here and I have three. Now I'm going to look up to between 61 and 68.3. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven observations in that next interval. There's seven. Now we're going up to 77.49. One, two, three, four, five, six in that next interval. And the last one, well, now I'm just going to count everything that's left, everything that's greater than 77, 49. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow, somebody got more than 100%. Eight observations. That's it. Now we can go through the same calculations that we did in all of the previous chi-squared tests. Our test statistic, it's identical. Our test statistic here, let me, I'm scrolling around to try to find some room. Our test statistic here is still looking at the difference between our observed frequencies, our expected frequency squared. Well, before we add those up, we divide by that expected frequency, and then we add those up. That gives us our upper tail chi-squared test statistic based on this same notion. If what we observe is very similar to what we expect, those differences are small, chi-squared is small, that supports the null. Again, because these expected values are determined based on the null being true. So if what we see is very similar to what we expect if the null is true, well then that supports the null. 
But if what we see is very different from what we expect, if the null is true, well then that says, well, maybe our expectation is wrong. Maybe the null is wrong. And that supports the alternative. So let's go through all of these same calculations. The next one here, we'll just look at those differences. Then, of course, we square those differences. Then we divide by the expected value, which in every case is going to be 5. Then we add them up to get our test statistic. Okay, so here I have minus 4. Minus 4 squared is 16. 16 over 5 is 3.2. 5 minus 5, 0, 0, 0. 3 minus 5 is 2, 4, and 0.8. Next one as well, 2, 4, and 0.8. Next one here, we have 1, 1, and 0.2. And finally, the last one, 3, 9, and 1.8. Now I'm going to add those up. 1.8 plus 0.2 plus 0.8 plus 0.8 plus 0 plus 3.2. And that gives me my chi-squared 6.8. Finally, we finally got there. Okay, now we can take a deep breath. Now we need to go to our chi-squared tables. So we need to know which chi-squared distribution is relevant for this test, so we need the degrees of freedom. Well, the degrees of freedom for this particular test can be given by k minus p minus one, where k is the same as it's always been, this is the number of categories. The number of categories here is defined by the number of intervals that we are working with. So for us, we defined six intervals. So I have six categories. P is the number of coefficients, or the number of parameters that we have estimated. In this exercise, we have estimated two parameters, We've estimated the average grade, and we estimated the standard deviation. So P here is equal to 2. So I have 6 minus 2 minus 1. We have 3 degrees of freedom. Okay, now we can go down to our chi-squared table. We are doing this test at the 05 level of significance. We have 20, not 20, we have three degrees of freedom. Our test statistic is 6.8. So let's come down to our chi-squared table. I have three degrees of freedom. Alpha is 05, and our test statistic is between these two values. So here we have, I'll just draw a little small picture in here. We have our chi-squared distribution. We have here a critical value that corresponds to 0.05 is 7.815. We have a test statistic of 6.8. Well, like every other test, that critical value defines the reject space and the do not reject space. Here I can see if this area is equal to 0.05. Well, this area must be greater than 0.05. So if we follow the critical value rejection rule or the p-value rejection rule, as always, these must give us the same result, the same conclusion. Here we find using both of these approaches, we are unable to reject the null hypotheses. Our p-value is less than 0.1, but it's greater than 0.05. So 
that's it. We have our p-value less than 0.1, greater than 0.05. At that level of significance, we are unable to reject the null hypotheses, which means that those differences between what we observed and what we expected to observe, right, these differences here, they're not statistically significant. There's not enough evidence in those differences to bring us to support the alternative hypotheses. Our evidence here supports the null hypotheses. We are unable to say that this distribution is not normally distributed with a mean of 60. Why did I say 65? That was a mistake right at the beginning of the video. 61. We are unable to support the alternative hypotheses, unable to say that the population is not normally distributed with a mean of 61, standard deviation 17. Okay, well, that turned into a long video. The next one, I'll try to keep it a little bit shorter. I hope that this was helpful. Uh, these calculations is probably among the most tedious that we will be doing for now. Thank you for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.